Nebraska has uh, uh, some of the best wind energy wind in the country, up. and uh, we're not utilizing it. And uh, Union Pacific could transport up. wind turbines instead of coal, wind, uh, and uh, this would be enormously helpful right for our there. children's future. Uh, I'm here with Nebraskans for Peace, and I just think it's important that we pay attention to the direction that our world is headed and that we act now to preserve our Earth for a better future. Absolutely. If you don't mind, I'm going to start with a little bit of science for a few minutes, just to kind of make sure everybody's up to date with where we are. I was, um, when I got here yesterday, some of the people I was talking to at the motel and things were, were telling me that uh, the last few weeks there's been all kind of flooding on the Elkhorn and on the flat, and cars washed away and things like that. And I was uh, telling them that that's exactly what's happening all over the planet now. One of the most important physical facts for this century is that warm air holds more water vapor than cold air does. The atmosphere of the planet is about 5% moister than it was 40 years ago, which is an astonishing change in a basic physical parameter of the Earth in a very short period of time. And the result is that we see these unbelievable, in, in dry areas, we get more drought uh, as more water evaporates, but once that water is up in the atmosphere, when it comes down, we see absolutely horrific downpour and deluge all over the Earth. And almost every week, it's someplace else. Uh, this winter in Washington, D.C., they had twice as much snow as they'd ever had before because it was so much wetter and as long as the temperature is below 32 that falls as snow. A month and a half ago it was Nashville's turn. They had the biggest rainstorm they've ever recorded there uh, 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 and lots of people died. A couple of weeks ago it was Guatemala, uh, the first tropical storm of the year. Tropical storm Agatha dropped more rain than they'd ever seen. Villages washed away. Uh, last weekend it was Arkansas up in the mountains, 20 campers dead because the rivers rose higher than they'd ever risen before. Then it was Oklahoma City, which got 10 inches of rain three days ago in about a three hour period and had flooding like they'd never observed. That's the scale of the kind of change that we're already starting to see as the planet warms. And it's why this work that you're about here today is so incredibly important. I, I wrote the first book about climate change 21 years ago now, in 1989, a book called The End of Nature. And at the time, we knew most of what we needed to know about global warming. We knew that the molecular structure of CO2 trapped heat that would otherwise radiate back out to space. And we knew that by burning coal and glass and oil, we were putting lots and lots of CO2 in the atmosphere. The only thing we didn't know was how quickly it was going to pinch. And being human, we wanted it to take a long time, because then it would be somebody else's problem to deal with. But the story of the last 20 years is that it's not taking a long time. It's happening way faster than we imagined. So far, human beings have raised the temperature of the planet about one degree. 20 years ago, we wouldn't have thought that that was enough to cause huge change. We would have thought huge change would be still a couple of degrees and a few decades down the road. But people underestimated just how finely balanced the planet was. And that one degree has been enough to make almost everything start to go haywire. Hydrological cycles, as I've described, the way the water moves around the planet. Everything frozen on Earth is melting and melting very fast. In fact, last week, the sea ice data center said that the new satellite images showed that we're ahead of the record 2007 melt of Arctic sea ice. Um, the oceans themselves, we've been watching those horrific pictures from the Gulf, uh, uh, of the oil spill in the Gulf. Although actually, it doesn't strike me you can really call it an oil spill, you know, unless you call a knife wound, a kind of blood spill or something. I mean, they've punched a hole in the bottom of the ocean and they don't know how to fix it. But we've watched that incredible, ugly picture. But what we need to bear in mind all the time is that even if that oil had made it safely to shore and 
been burned in the gas tanks of our cars, it still would have been an environmental disaster. It's what would have raised the temperature of the Earth, and not only raised the temperature, but affected the oceans directly. As Dr. Johansson and others have written about a good deal, uh, 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 we're seeing a remarkable acidification of seawater all over the planet. The ocean's about 30% more acid. Already, organisms at the bottom of the marine food chain are having a hard time reproducing and forming shells. Even the basic temperature is rising and rising all the time. NASA indeed said last week that we've just come through the warmest 12 months that we know of on record, and that it's almost certain that 2010 will be the warmest calendar year on record. We were talking with our 350 organizers in the Asian subcontinent uh, about 10 days ago. These are old friends of ours. They never, ever complain about the heat because it's hot in India and Pakistan. But they were complaining that day because they just set a new all-time record for temperature in Asia. The temperature in Pakistan 10 days ago went to 129 degrees. Um, people were dying by the hundreds across India in the worst heat wave since the British began keeping records uh, 150 or 200 years ago. This destabilization is moving very, very fast, much faster than we anticipated. What we have now that's useful for our understanding of it, what we have now finally is a number. In January of 2008, a team of NASA researchers put out probably the most important paper on climate that there's ever been. And it said that we now know enough for looking at the paleoclimatic record, the historic climate record, and real-time observations of things like Arctic ice belt. We know enough to say that the magic number is 350. Any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million, they said, was not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. These are NASA scientists working for the federal government. Uh, these are not crazy environmentalists. These are the most important climatologists in the world. It's a really scary number. because we're already way past it. The air out here today is 390 parts per million CO2. That's why the Arctic is melting. That's why we're setting new temperature records. That's why the Elkhorn and the Platte flood more often than they used to, on and on and on. One of the things that that analysis told us right away when people started doing the numbers was that we were going to have to leave most of the coal that we have in the ground now in the ground if we have any hope of ever getting back to 350 parts per million. If over the next 20 years we're able to stop burning fossil fuel on this planet, then oceans and forests will soak up slowly that excess carbon. And if we do a better job of managing healthy soils, they'll begin to sequester some of that carbon too as we learn new and more useful ways of farming. But the one thing we can't do is burn most of the coal that we have lying around this planet. We have an awful lot of it, and it's awful cheap, and so it's always going to be a great temptation to try and make some money burning that coal. And we can't do it because it emits twice as much carbon even as natural gas for BTU. It is the dirtiest stuff on Earth. And that's the bottom line for the fight about climate going forward.